Napoleon. 1769 to 1821. French society was in tatters after the reign of terror. Bandits roamed the land. Royal, royalists plotted to restore the monarchy. Britain, Austria, and Prussia joined forces against the faltering French Republic, hoping to snuff out the revolution there before it spread to other countries. Defending France in this crisis was Napoleon Bonaparte, a brilliant young commander intent on restoring his nation to glory and dominating Europe. Born in 1769 on the island of Corsica, which became part of France that same year, Napoleon graduated from the French Military Academy in Paris and rose to prominence during the Revolution, achieving the rank of Brigadier General at the age of 24. In 1795, he put down a rebellion by royalists in Paris and went on to lead French forces to victory over Austria, which ceded Belgium to France in 1797. A year later, Napoleon invaded Egypt and threatened British control of India. Superior on land but outclassed by sea, um, by the British at sea, he was forced to, to withdraw from Egypt but returned to France a hero. Uh, at this time, Britain was the greatest naval power. In 1799, Napoleon and fellow conspirators overthrew the Directory that ruled France and established a government led by three consuls. He was named First Consul and assumed near dictatorial powers. In 1804, he became emperor with the consent of the French people, who approved him as their monarch by a vote of 3,572,329 to 2,569. Napoleon did not entirely abandon the principles of the French Revolution. His Napoleonic Code, issued in 1804, promised all male citizens equality before the law. He instituted public education and reformed the tax system. He put numbers on houses alongside roads. He dispensed with others uh, with other democratic ideals fostering during the Revolution, including freedom of expression and representative government. He, he muzzled the press, jailed political opponents, handpicked the legislature, and offered no apologies for restoring the monarchy. He quote, I found the crown of France on the ground, and I picked it up with my sword. Uh, Napoleon helped the economy. Napoleon capitalized on his popularity in France by recruiting a huge citizen army. By 1805, he was once again at war with a formidable alliance of rival powers, including Britain, Austria, and Russia. In October, his fleet was torn apart by the British Royal Navy in the Battle of Trafalgar in the coast of Spain. Two months later, however, Napoleon reaffirmed his supremacy on land by crushing the combined armies of Austria and Russia in the Battle of Austerlitz. In years to come, he defeated Prussia and invaded Spain. By 1810, he controlled most of Western Europe, including all of Italy and much of Germany. Ultimately, Napoleon was a victim of his own success and arrogance. When he seized Spain and installed his brother on the throne, he ignited a fiery uprising there. Rebels in Spain and neighboring Portugal received support from Britain, Napoleon's chief opponent, and bedeviled French troops. Napoleon antagonized other European nations by prohibiting them from trading with Britain. When Tsar Alexander I of Russia defied the ban, Napoleon invaded that country in 1812 and exposed his army to of some 600,000 men to the most dangerous enemy it had ever faced, the brutal Russian winter. His forces occupied Moscow, but the Russians burned the city and left. With winter approaching, the French began a long and disastrous retreat. Half a million men were lost, some to the Russian army, others to starvation or exposure. Following that debacle, forces allied against Napoleon's forces that allied against Napoleon, seized Paris in 1814 and exiled him to Elba, off the coast of Italy. The boundaries of France returned to those of 1792. In 1815, Napoleon escaped, rallied his troops in France, and set out to regain lost territory. Britain and Prussia combined forces to oppose him. Britain's Duke of Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. He was placed under house arrest on the island of St. Helena, off the coast of Africa, where he died in 1821. Although the empire he forged crumbled, Napoleon transformed Europe, partly in response to his success in exploiting French nationalism. Germans and other European ethnic groups began aspiring to nationhood and ultimately achieved it, altering the balance of power in the region and in the world as a whole. And so uh, Napoleon uh, was a great figure, and some have even suggested that he should be called Napoleon the Great.
Latin American independence, 1800 to 1830. Struggles for independence swept Latin America after 1800, triggered by the decline of Spanish power. Spain had reached the height of its wealth and influence in the 16th century. Since then, the Spanish American empire had become less rewarding. Colonizing North American provinces such as Florida and New Mexico had been a drain on the royal treasury. By 1800, Spain's position in Europe had deteriorated. King Charles IV was virtually a pawn of Napoleon. In 1808, when Charles faced a palace coup and was forced to abdicate in favor of his son Ferdinand VII, Napoleon stepped in and put his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, on the throne. Spaniards rebelled and joined neighboring Portugal in a guerrilla war against Napoleon that lasted until, the abdicated, until he abdicated as emperor of France in 1814. The collapse of the Spanish monarchy in 1808 opened the floodgates of rebellion in Latin America. After Napoleon's downfall, Ferdinand VII regained the throne, but he was an uh, arch-conservative who faced strong opposition from those favoring constitutional government. During his troubled reign, one Latin American country after another broke away until only Cuba and Puerto Rico remained under Spanish control. Latin Americans had various reasons for seeking independence, like the American colonists, they resented taxes and trade restrictions placed on them by others. Some wanted freedom and constitutional rights. Others simply wanted to be rid of European overseers. Independence, independence struggles were complicated by disputes between liberals who hoped to forge a democratic society and conservatives who wanted to oust peninsulares, the ruling class from Spain, but preserve a system that kept power and privileges in the hands of an elite minority. Political disputes aggravated racial and social tensions between privileged Creoles, Latin Americans of pure Spanish ancestry, and those of Indian or African ancestry. The independence movement in South America was dominated by two remarkable freedom fighters, Simón Bolívar, hailed as El Liberator, Liberador, Liberta, Libertador, the Liberator, and José de San Martín. Bolivar's campaign began in his native Venezuela and spread south while San Martin launched his revolution in Argentina and moved north. Ultimately, their paths converged in Peru. Uh, so you have Bolivar in, native, in, his, in Venezuela, San Martin in Argentina, and they met in Peru. Uh, born to wealth and privilege, Bolivar studied in Europe and was influenced by philosophers such as Rousseau, whose writings inspired Republicans in France and elsewhere to rebel against royalty. After returning to Venezuela, Bolivar helped to overthrow the Spanish governor there in 1810 and then went on to defeat royalist forces and take control in 1813. His goal, however, was to establish a constitutional government with a legislature consisting of two bodies, one elected by the people and the other with hereditary membership, and a president who would rule for life. Something like a constitutional monarchy was necessary, he believed, to maintain order in a region that had long been ruled autocratically and had no experience with democracy. He hoped to unite emerging states like Venezuela and Colombia as part of a larger nation and keep the region from splitting into many small countries ill-equipped to compete with greater powers. To put these ideas into practice, Bolivar first crushed opposition from Spanish royalists in the area. Uh, there's a long debate on whether or not Bolivar was a liberator or a dictator. Um, but in any case, in 1819, he proclaimed the Republic of Gran Colombia embracing present-day Colombia, Panama, and Venezuela. Three years later, Ecuador joined the Republic. Bolivar served as president of this expanding nation, which won recognition from the United States. His ultimate goal was, however, to con was the control of Peru, where San Martin was engaged in a prolonged struggle with royalists. In July 1822, Bolivar and San Martin met in Ecuador to decide the future of the revolutionary movement in South America. Born in Argentina, San Martin had grown up in Spain, where he distinguished himself as an army officer. In 1812, he returned to Argentina and cast his lot with the revolutionaries. Like Bolivar, he was a Creole uh, who turned against his ancestral country to fight for the freedom of his native land. Again, um, Creoles were Latin Americans of pure Spanish ancestry. Um, and so... Uh, so what that meant uh, for him to fight for the freedom of his native land was that uh, he needed to conquer Peru, where the Spanish viceroy in Lima had long exercised authority over neighboring lands, including Argentina and Chile. In 1817, San Martin landed an army until Chile, where he defeated royalists and placed the government in the hands of Chilean revolutionary Bernardo O'Higgins. 
Then San Martin invaded Peru, occupying Lima, occupying Lima in 1821 and proclaiming the country independent. Royalists remained in control of the rugged interior, however, and he sought the meeting with Bolivar in 1822 to devise a strategy for securing Peru. San Martin may have hoped for an alliance with Bolivar, but Bolivar had consolidated his power to the north and was stronger. San Martin yielded and Bolivar took power in Lima. By 1825, he had crushed royalists holding out in upper Peru, the southern interior region that became known as Bolivia in his honor. At the height of his power, Bolivar grew more authoritarian and posed efforts to limit his powers constitutionally. He became the target of revolutionaries in Venezuela who wanted to secede from Gran Colombia and form a genuine republic. In 1828, he barely escaped assassination and abdicated a year later. Several nations emerged from the realm he liberated and ultimately lost. So I guess you could say that he began a liberator and then eventually became a dictator. The independence movement took a different form in Portuguese-controlled Brazil. In 1807, Prince Regent... Uh, John left Portugal to escape domination by Napoleon and set up a court in exile in Rio de, de, de Janeiro. Uh, and John brought with him half the money in the nation's treasury and some 15,000 followers. Rio was transformed into a bustling capital with a population of nearly 100,000. In 1815, Brazil became a kingdom, but pressure was building on John to return to Portugal now that Napoleon was no longer a threat. In 1821, he did so at the insistence of Portugal's new constitutional government, leaving his son Pedro behind as regent. The government in Lisbon decided to reclaim control of Brazil, prompting a rebellion among Brazilians who were royal to the prince but resisted being ruled from abroad. He embraced the rebellion and declared Brazil independent in 1822. Some Portuguese troops there resisted independence, but they were defeated by Brazilian forces commanded by a British admiral, Lord Cochrane. The British had aided the Portuguese court in exile at Rio, both to frustrate Napoleon in Europe and to promote their own interests. Now they were Brazil's chief trading partner. Support from Britain and the presence of an acknowledged leader in, in Pedro, ad, uh, elevated to the position of emperor, enabled Brazil to endure while Bolivar's Gran Colombia was breaking apart. Brazil emerged as the largest nation in South America. In 1810, an impassioned Catholic priest named Miguel Hidalgo y Castilla ignited an uprising by poor Mexicans, many of them Indians or people of mixed ancestry, against the Spanish ruling class. In addition to independence, Hidalgo y Castilla sought an end to slavery and the exploitation of native peoples. His followers attacked Spanish officials and landowners, destroying their homes and leaving many people dead. Some wealthy Creoles were targeted as well, and Mexicans of Spanish ancestry who had originally supported Hidalgo, himself a Creole, turned against him because they feared for their lives and property. In 1811, Spanish forces defeated Hidalgo and executed him. Another priest loyal to the cause, Jose Maria Morelos y Pavon, carried on the fight until he too was captured and executed in 1815. Fighting continued sporadically until 1820 when King Ferdinand VII of Spain was forced to accept the constitution that limited his, his powers and the privileges of the wealthy elite within what remained of the Spanish Empire. Some Creoles in Mexico then decided to, to back independence in the hope of controlling events there and protecting their place in society. Among those who shifted side was the Mexican officer Augustin de Iturbide who was ordered to crush the rebel leader, Vicente Guerrero, and instead joined forces with him against the royalists. In 1821, Iturbide took control of Mexico City and proclaimed independence. Iturbide antagonized those who hoped for a new order in Mexico by declaring himself emperor in 1822. Banished in an uprising the following year, he tried to return to power and was seized and executed. In 1824, a constitutional government took shape, and Guadalupe Victoria, a hero of the revolution, was elected the first president of the Republican Republic of Mexico. Guadalupe Victoria. Power struggles continued for several years after 1824. Plagued by political instability and financial problems, Mexico had difficulty competing with the United States and ultimately lost its northernmost territories to its expansive neighbor.